The moon doesn't have an atmosphere. What kind of clickbaity nonsense title is that? I hate it when vloggers do that. It's pathetic. Oh, apparently I did that. And uh, now that I think about it, it makes perfect sense. Just keep watching and you'll find out why. Today on Game Revolutions, the series where I write a game and show you how I do it, we will revisit double buffering and we'll explore how a series of small incremental improvements can really screw things up, leading to a bug that I've been putting off for quite a while, until now. And we'll tie up a loose end that I left at the end of the hit detection tricks video. I'll keep things at a fairly high level. I'll be using mostly pseudocode rather than assembly, but we are going to dive deep. Cue that disco chip tune. When you're not doing double buffering, both the code that you're writing and your display chip agree where the screen memory is. So for example, in Disk Extended Color Basic, the screen memory starts at address hex E100. So the code you write will do all of its drawing there, and the display chip has been programmed to use that memory to construct the signal that it sends out to the monitor. But when you use double buffering, now you have two different regions of memory reserved to hold the contents of the screen. Your display chip will be pointing to one of those regions, and that's what will be on the screen at that point, and we call that the on-screen buffer. Meanwhile, your code is writing to the other buffer, building up the next frame of the game. When the frame is complete, you swap positions. Now the display generator has a chance to show the frame you've just drawn, and while that's happening, you get to be writing the next frame in what is now the off-screen buffer. But that was a bit of a simplification. Your screen does not display the contents immediately. Depending on where the electron beam of your screen is at any given point, that is the amount of the frame that's been drawn at that point. So what's really happening is, while you're slowly getting those scan lines drawn to your screen for the previous frame, your code is writing out the next frame in possibly a totally different order, different regions of the screen getting written at different times, depending on whatever is most convenient. And it doesn't matter in what order those pixels are getting drawn, because they're all getting drawn privately. It's only when the display chip is finished rendering the previous frame that you do the swap and people see what's going on. So it's imperative that your code finish its drawing of the next frame before the previous frame is finished rendering onto the screen. So your code is going to need a variable next frame buffer. Rather than hard coding where the screen memory begins, for example E100, you refer to this variable to tell you where you need to write your memory. And you'll start that variable off pointing to one of the buffers, call it buffer A. Meanwhile, your display chip is going to point to the other buffer. And now the game loop can begin. For each iteration of the game loop, you do whatever game logic you need to do, you draw the graphics for the next frame wherever that variable next frame buffer points, and then you do a sync. I have another video that goes into a lot more detail on vertical sync and interrupts, and you don't need to know all that for this video, but you're welcome to take a look if you want a deeper dive. For our purposes now, sync is a magic instruction that just waits until the screen's electron beam has reached the bottom. At that point, we're in what's called the blanking interval. Nothing is getting drawn to the screen for a small bit. So we have a little bit of time to do stuff that won't have any impact on the visible frame. And that's when we do the swap. We now set the display chip to point to the buffer that we were just working on, and we point the next frame buffer to where the display chip used to be pointing so we can draw our next frame there. And that's the end of the loop, so we go back up and repeat again. And given that the screen refreshes at 60 frames per second, you can expect 60 iterations of that game loop to run each second. But there's a problem with this. It's too fast! Check out how fast the ground is moving! 
What kind of reflexes do we need to expect from the player to do all that jumping and all that shooting? When the game loop scrolls the ground every single frame, and we've got 60 frames per second, that's a lot of scrolling. We've got to slow this down somehow. So the fix that I applied to my game loop was just to add a bunch of extra sinks in the middle. I was literally dropping frames on the floor. The loop starts off the same. I do my logic, I draw my graphics wherever next frame buffer points, and then I wait until the frame has been fully drawn so that I can swap. Now the screen starts rendering that frame that I just drew and I wait for that to complete. And then I wait another frame and another frame, just slowing everything down. And now I'm ready to go back up and repeat. Now this pace is a lot more manageable, but there's still something that feels wrong here. Check out the bullets. They just kind of float around like balloons. They're so leisurely. Can I make the bullets go faster, but not everything else? And so here's where things got a bit more complicated. Again, we start off the same. We do our game logic. We draw our graphics wherever next frame buffer points. We do a sync, but instead of doing a full swap, we do half the swap. We point the display chip at the buffer we just drew, but we don't change next frame buffer. So now I'm going to start animating the bullets to the same buffer that I'm currently rendering on the screen. I'll wait for that to finish rendering and I will write again onto the on-screen buffer. Wait for that to finish, then again write to the on-screen buffer, wait for that to finish. The reason I'm writing directly to the on-screen buffer is I don't need to redraw everything else. The mountains aren't moving, the ground isn't moving, the car isn't moving. The only thing that's moving are a few pixels. Just the bullets going up and to the right. So as long as I do that quickly enough, I'll stay ahead of the beam and no one is the wiser. When I'm done with three frames of bullets, I can complete the swap that I started before. I now can point next frame buffer to the other buffer. So it truly is now an offline buffer again. And I go back up to the top of the loop and repeat. Now we're talking. I've got the best of both worlds. The scrolling speed is manageable, but the bullets are flying by like bullets are supposed to do. But have you noticed the bug? The triple bullet bug. Take a look at where the bullets are as they reach up into the mountains, but before they head up to the sky. Each bullet becomes three bullets temporarily. Here's what I had to say about this when I first noticed it. You might also notice that as it gets up here, the bullet kind of, there's this weird effect where it goes from one to like kind of three bullets. Um, I've been debating what to do about that and what's causing that. And I've decided this is a natural effect of the refraction of the bullet through the atmosphere that we all know the moon has. The, uh, the light through the moon atmosphere is causing that effect. And I need to leave it for proper realism. So uh, that's, that's what I'm going to say about that. Well, I decided to stop being such a lazy doofus. So I looked into the problem, and it turns out it has to do with how I erase things. When I first added double buffering to the game, I decided to make full use of it. For every frame, I would draw every part of the screen from scratch. The yellow status region, I would redraw every time. The blue sky and the earth, redraw every time. All of that boring background green, I would redraw it every time. And so on. The beauty of this is that when I move sprites around, I don't have to erase them. I'm always redrawing the background every time. But I quickly learned this just takes way too much time. So I decided that the only parts of the background I would redraw every time are the parts that move. So only the rotating mountains and the gravel at the very top of the ground. Everything else would be treated as a sprite that had to be drawn and then erased so that the next time it was drawn in its new position, it would appear to be moving. That even included things like the mile markers, the holes, and of course the enemies and the bullets. So that begs the question, how do you erase something? Well, if you guarantee the background is always the same color, you just erase something by redrawing that rectangle with just the background color. 
When these feeblas move around, I just erase them with a rectangle of green before I draw them in the new place. When these horizontal bullets fly to the right, I just blank them out with green before I draw them in the new place. But these vertical bullets are another story. When they're in the green region, I need to erase them with green. When they're in the blue region, I need to erase them with blue. And what about when they're in the mountain region? Sometimes there's that highlight of yellow. It's not clear based on the position exactly what color might be behind it. So I decided to erase the bullets with whatever pixels were behind it at the time they were drawn. What a great and ingenious idea I had. Here's what happens when you do that. Watch what happens when the bullets hit just the edge of the mountain range. You get kind of like a flash, almost like a bit of lightning when they hit near the edge of the mountain. Why would that be happening? Because I'm erasing the bullet with the pixels that were behind it at the time it was drawn. But in the next frame, I've moved the mountains. And so now I'm erasing the bullet with where the mountains used to be. So these flashes you're seeing are the pieces of the mountain where they used to be when the bullet was first drawn. Maybe I'm not a genius. So my ingenious fix to this was simply not to erase bullets whenever they're in the mountain range. The mountains are going to get redrawn over the bullets, so why bother erasing them? This is like a slice of the dream I was hoping to have before. Let the background redraw itself, and you don't have to erase anything. But that's now what led to this triple bullet refraction nonsense. Why would this lead to a triple bullet refraction nonsense? Because in these extra frames, when I'm only drawing bullets, I'm not drawing the mountains behind them anymore. I'm just doing bullets. So I stop erasing the bullets when I draw them during these frames. <sighs> The fix is to simply always erase bullets, unless the bullet happens to be in this region, the mountain range, and the mountain range is rotating this frame. The structure that tracks information about each drawn bullet contains a dedicated flags field. Bit six is set if we detect that it's in the rotating mountain range. And then bit seven is set if we actually rotate that mountain range during this frame. Then we simply avoid erasing the bullet if we see that bit 7 is set. And so finally, the scrolling speed is good. The bullet speed is good. And the bullets erase themselves no matter where they are on the screen. But we're not done! There's a loose end from that hit detection tricks video! Check out that guy! There is actually one more trick that I will go over in a future video. And that's about allocating which work you do in each frame of the game. If you keep your eye on the upper meter, you'll see for each frame how much of the frame is remaining by the time we're done with all of our work. And the higher the meter, the better it is. Think of it like a fuel gauge. You want it as close to full as you can get it. And you'll see that it comes down when there's a lot more work to do, in particular when there's a lot of hit detection to do because there are many feeblas and there are many bullets. So you'll notice in the worst case, that meter comes down to the single digits. And if we run this long enough, we'll get a decent average that tells us about how well we're doing. So to get a lot of data points, we're going to go into turbo mode. Michael, don't you think you better do something? Hold on. You're not thinking of, oh my word, you are. What is that? So that bottom average meter seems to have settled around 21.5, 21.6. So what can we do to keep the work from pushing us to dangerously low territory in that meter? We have our main loop that does all the work, and then we have these extra special sinks that do work just for the bullets. What if we don't do any bullet work in the main loop at all? In this way, we take the work of doing hit detection, drawing the bullets, erasing the bullets, and we take it out of the frame where we're doing all of the other work. We lighten the load there, and it's okay because we're doing it in these extra three frames anyway. What will that do to the performance? I'll also add another few meters, and that's what these are doing. These are helping us time the extra three frames where we're not doing the full load of work. 
When we run this now, we're still going to pay attention to these two meters to tell us the current and the average for the big frame. But for the extra three frames where we're doing much less work, we're going to see how high those meters stay. So you'll notice the meter up here on the left does not get into that dangerous single digit territory. Whereas these meters here tend to be mostly in the white all the way, although they flash a bit. And I believe that flashing is happening because there's such little work to do sometimes when there are much fewer bullets that we begin the frame when we're just about to start V-blank, and then we end the frame when we still haven't even started V-blank yet. Because the interrupt happens before V-blank. It happens when we're in the right-hand margin just before we're about to hit the very bottom. So these are extremely healthy, and when they flash like that, it's even healthier. So let's go into turbo mode and get some more data points for the average meter. We seem to be at least a good 10 or 11% higher than we were before. So this is what I mean about allocating work in different frames to keep each frame short enough that it can be finished before the beam has recycled back to the top again. And we'll tie up a loose end that I left at the end of the hit detection video. I'll try to keep things at a fairly high level using mostly pseudocode rather than assembly, but we are going to dive deep. Cue that disco chiba boom! I'll keep things mostly at a high level using more. <laughs> I'll keep things at a high level using mostly pseudocode rather than assembly, but we are going to dive deep. I'll keep things at a high level using mostly pseudocode rather than, but we are going to dive deep. I'll keep things at a fairly high level. I'll keep things at a fairly high level. I'll be using mostly pseudocode rather than assembly. But we are going, oh.